we're a bunch of comedians. Most of us here are based on Long Island uh, and in New York. Some of us are in New York City. Uh, a lot of us are uh, um, not doing it that long, you know, a couple of years. You know, we're, we're at all different kind of levels. And uh, we're all obviously because of what's going on. Nobody's getting stage time. Uh, we do have a pretty decent scene out here on in the open mic kind of level, you know, and the okay. clubs and everything. So these, what you're meeting are some of the people that do that. We're doing this in lieu. And instead of doing a virtual open mic, which I didn't think was a good idea, I kind of think if you're going to do stand-up, you really need an audience, a live audience yeah. to do stand-up. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Doing it to a bunch of people looking at their computer, probably not wearing any pants, is not the ideal way to do this, right? Yeah. So yeah, I decided I'm we focus. Oh you know, we focus on uh, helping each other work on our material. <laughs> so we write jokes. It's like a writer's room, but we're all stand ups and we're helping each other. And uh, I really was excited about you coming because I know uh, you you yourself have a, a very prestigious. Uh, writing history, you've written for Jeff Foxworthy on uh, Grammy nominated, a couple of Grammy nominated albums, uh, worked on some comedy television shows that you've written for. Obviously, you've written your own stand up material. Uh, so that's fascinating in and of itself. But really, what attracted me was I saw you a few, uh, maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago, mention that you have. Uh, a new uh, multimedia show about the history of stand-up comedy. Yeah. Give me for getting this wrong. Uh, America's reflection, America's reflection in a funhouse mirror. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Right. Yeah, that's which, it. which is like a multimedia presentation. And uh, so I, and you've written several books or been part of uh, co-authored some books too. Uh, about stand-up, your own history. So you're the guy, you're the fascinating guy that I really wanted to interview. And um, But that all said, <laughs> I, got one, I got two questions for you, right? Yeah. Where do you think stand-up comedy started? How did it start in this country? Well, it's, it, I, I did the research. You know, I was friends with Phyllis Diller. Uh, anybody your friends, friends here remember Phyllis Diller? But she was the first female star comic, stand-up comic. The first female I star comic. I was friends with her. And, and she, was, she was a big on the history of stand-up comedy. And she wanted me to write a book. So I started writing books. So the first thing I did was I looked at Mark Twain because I was pretty familiar with Twain. Not as much as a guy named Barry Crimmins. He was like a real expert. But I, I'm right, pretty first. He passed away recently. Yeah. Right. And... um. Twain wrote an essay about the funniest guy he ever saw named Artemis Ward. And he's completely forgotten. He started doing stand-up in 1861. He died in London, acclaimed as an American original in 1867. The London mm. Times stamped what he was doing as an American original. They had never seen anything like it. No, you, ha you can't even... There are like four or five books written about the guy. He's completely forgotten because there's no recordings of him. I have a couple right. of... Uh, 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 Newspaper carvings, they would do wood carvings. They didn't put photographs in newspapers back then. So they were wood carvings of him on stage doing what he did. But what he did was what we do. And in fact, when he stated it, when he started doing it, he said, I'm going to go on stage and try to make them laugh as long as they can for as hard as they can. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, he, he was such a stand up. I mean, I, I wrote a script about the guy. I'm, I'm completely obsessed with him. Really? But what he did was the first, he was the first stamp. And you kind of remember, it, it, forget like television or radio and all that. There was comedy, any comedy was just a small part of anything. It, they had this, it was a, a, a philosopher named Hobbes who had a, his whole take on comedy was when you're laughing, you're laughing at somebody or something. So to laugh too much at somebody or something was rude. So they didn't put too much comedy in anything. There were no full out ball, 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 go for it comedies back then. There was a little spice in any, any drama or a presentation of whatever they were doing. So he was so radical. It's really tough to understand how different what he, people would walk out and say, you know, I laughed, but I didn't learn anything. Cause every time they went to hear somebody speak, they wanted to learn something. I mean, it's just, it was it was just different. So he he really does set the set it down as the first guy. 
There's, and his last name, Artemis Hayes? Or, I'm sorry. What was Ward. Uh, Artemis Ward. He, Artemis he, Ward. He, his, yeah, his real name was Charles Farrar Brown. He was from Maine. He was a newspaper writer who created this fictional character, like letters to the editors. I mean, newspapers were everything back then. People got their information in comedy. So he, he wrote these funny letters to the editor, and it became a huge hit in America. You know, wow. The population, population of America was about um, 40 million. So you got to even look at the size of America then. This was all, right. you know, then, then when the Civil War started, I mean, look, that guy was not unknown. He was a huge, he was one of the first stars in America. Lincoln was a fan. He used to sneak in the White House and, and entertain Lincoln. But he was a big drinker. He loved hash. He liked the party. And he had um, uh, tuberculosis, which would kill him at the age of 32. Uh, ooh. Wow. Wow, that was yeah. young. That was yeah. young. Yeah. Oh, he was dying. He was dying in London. I mean, nobody knew anything. They didn't call it tuberculosis. They called it consumption. Yeah, right. They called him a lunger. You know, the, so when he was dying on stage in London, Twain was going on stage the first time in San Francisco doing it. And, and he admitted, he said, doing exactly what I saw Artemis Ward do. He I, even took the same slacker character that, that Ward had presented and did deadpan comedy the way Ward did. I, Ward virtually invented deadpan comedy. Everybody back there was a muggy clown or, or minstrel player. Right. I mean, that's amazing. I, 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 you know what? I'm now right there. I learned something today. I, I don't think I've ever heard of Artemis Ward. Uh, so, so now let's let's jump hundred years ahead, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we talk about um, what are the roots of modern comedy today. And you, you started doing stand-up comedy in 1977. Yeah. First so time on stage. Yeah. Right. So, so the, I would imagine the people that inspired you were some of these seminal figures in uh, the beginning of modern stand-up comedy. Yeah, the guys I to say? Saw, yeah, guys I saw, I saw live in concert with George Carlin and Robert Klein, and and I, I never saw Richard Pryor live, uh, but I, I saw Steve Martin live. I saw these people, and, you know, obviously they, they were, that was a big, heady time. There weren't many stand-ups, but the ones, they were the, they were like very, very important, influential comics back then, Pryor and Carlin and, and Steve Martin and, um, Steve Barr was like the first stand-up rock star. They were they were really um, um, so when I started, there were no comedy clubs all over. I didn't even I was doing it for a year before I found out there were people doing it in New York City. I didn't know that there were showcase clubs in New York City. Mm. There weren't comedy clubs in every town. There weren't there were two at that time it's 77. Of course I didn't know about it. There were two paying comedy clubs in California. That was it. Mm. That was it. And 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 the LA scene and the New York, but there was a New York obviously comedy scene there were scenes like we formed one in boston and <clears throat> boston formed one and houston formed one in washington dc philadelphia there were these little scenes that started popping up but wow. nobody knew about each other there was no internet there was no like oh i know these guys are doing it over in chicago i'm going to go over to chicago and check them out we didn't know you didn't know anything yeah it's, it's hard to imagine today right and nobody right. Yeah. Every, yeah. everybody knows what everybody's doing instantly no no a guy came yeah. in a guy came in we're, we're i remember we we're doing a show in, in a place called elk brookman's all these comics there's lewis black and me and kevin bruni and ron zimmerman we're doing these shows at this place this bar so mm -hmm. this guy comes in he says hey can i do a guest set we're like sure man so his name was tony paul tony the paul he 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 managed uh, the holy city zoo in san francisco and he told me you got to come out here and come to our place we got a place like this too i'm like oh you mean other guys are doing this you know <laughs> <laughs> I was like what okay it's amazing that's amazing so can i ask why in uh, 1977 yeah right uh, steve martin's a rock star right he's about to be yeah, yeah. like and like about the sports arenas where, where the rolling stones would play he was playing like the big sports arenas Nobody right, and, 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 you, and you're a young man, and uh, yeah. you're, you're you're making your friends laugh. Is that what's is yeah. that how this starts? Everybody starts that way, and then you got to make that transition from making them laugh in the moment to making strangers laugh on command. That's the transition everybody has to make. Right, and how difficult was that for you at first? <laughs> <laughs> I just talked to a friend of mine. He was a he's a drummer in all sixties bands, right? So he knew me. He saw from every beginning. And he knew me in high school. And he was, you're always funny. But I watched you on stage. You were terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> I brought, he said, I brought some friends to see you. And they walked in and went, that guy sucked. And I like, I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you, hey, my, because I like, hey, what your friends think? So, oh, you have friends, they liked you. They like, he lied, he lied. You couldn't tell right. me how fun I was, you know? And right. then he said, he, then he said, I went to New York and I came back. And this was because he was living in D.C. And I came back and he said, I just saw it click. You got it. You got it somewhere. You just kept doing it and doing it until you click. It's just learning the craft. 
Right. The learning to be comfortable up there and strip away all the artifice because I was I was doing what I thought people thought would be funny. I tried doing Rodney Dangerfield one-liners, self-deprecating. I tried doing Steve Bart with props and a guitar in my act. I tried all sorts of guys up there. Before I stripped away, I just get this mushroom. Right, right. And you did these things when you were living in Jersey before you moved to New York or? Oh, no, 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 no. I was living in Washington. Oh, D.C. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, I've, and and then I moved to New York City because a, a, a club opened in 1979 in D.C., like the first professional club on the East Coast. And they started hiring guys from D.C. And some guys came through from L.A. too. And I was the house MC, So I met all these guys like Seinfeld and Gilbert Gottfried and, and Rick Overton and Glenn Hurt, all these comics. And they were like, you got to move to New York, man. Like, we'll help you out, get you an audition at the showcase. And then, of course, when I got up there, then I met, you know, the, the New York comedy scene and then the long island comedy scene there was all those guys out there right so, right yeah so so okay so, so and and how long i know i guess i guess you know you're an incredibly talented guy i'm a big fan a lot of people in comedy i, I mean we we'll go to your website all the guys that say nice things about you i mean i don't know how much you paid some of them but they're all they all <laughs> you are you are you you know you're considered a comics comic a lot of people say that about yourself but also you you know you you your timing was pretty good wasn't it uh getting into this in the late career 70s time, career timing was career. unbelievable unbelievable because when the thing opened up when the road opened up in 1980 i was ready and i and i always had this um you know i worked with jerry Seinfeld early on and <coughs> And, and people would say whatever they want. The guy was obsessed with it. I was obsessed with it. And all he thought about, and he was the first one that was like, you got to write every day. I write every day. I work every day. And then I take it on stage at night. And if I don't find the punchline when I'm writing it that day, when I take it on stage at night, that idea, a lot of times my ego forces one out. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't want to fail on stage, the super ego, whatever you want to call it. And so I do, I got a work ethic that I started then. And even though I'd be hung over, sometimes I'd be on a Coke run for a couple of days. I never stopped writing. I still would write. I mean, people, people around and go, what are you doing? I'd, I'd come out of bathrooms at a party. I'd, be, I'd hold up the bathroom because I was in there writing notes about what I thought was funny at the party. So I'd be in there scribbling down notes on the toilet paper or whatever <laughs> and holding up the line out there. They go, man, what are you doing in there? I go, I was writing jokes. I didn't tell them that, but you know, that's, that's what I was doing. I was in there <laughs> writing jokes. Totally, totally obsessed all the time. And I wrote every day. And you know what I found was, when I, his time I was right about a lot of things, but he was definitely right about that. The more I worked in right. the daytime, the funnier I got at night. And and I had a higher percentage of stuff that was working at night because I was going over in the daytime. You know, if I forced myself an hour, two hours a day to sit there and go over that stuff, I remembered it at night. And then I, I tried more stuff than other guys were trying. So when the road opened, I had more I had more of an act. I had more material. I, I was able to stay on stage longer. And that's all those clubs back then wanted. They didn't you didn't need you didn't need a Twitter following. You didn't need any credits in the talk shows. All you need to do was be able to hold a drunken crowd there for an hour, an hour and a half, because they were selling drinks like crazy. It was before Mothers Gets Drunk Driving changed the law. So they would they would just two hour do a two hour show. Do a three hour show. Hold drink, sell as many drinks as you can. Really? So, right. so, so, like, so your process. I got lucky. I got lucky. Yeah, right, right, lucky. right. So, so in the early days, you you uh, you worked really. At, it would be like a full time job to you, right? Well, that's all I cared about. I didn't care about it. I didn't take. I remember once reading a Richard Pryor article in Rolling Stone. I I never take a day off. I never took a day off. I lost girlfriends. They were like, we're never do anything. We don't go anywhere. I go go to the club every night. That's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I remember once a girlfriend, I was working on New Year's, she heckled me. I was working a New Year's Eve show and she wanted to go to a party. And I was like, I got a chance to go to a, a, a New Year's Eve show. So I went to the New Year's show. She was heckling me. I said, that's it. We're done. But I, I stayed on stage. I'd be off stage early. You know, I, I was right. obsessed with it. And right. so I, I don't know. I didn't know any other way. I, yeah. you know, I mean, everybody who I knew I was hanging out with back then, that's all. There was no amateurs there were no hobbyists there was nobody doing well i got a day job i never intend to quit there was nobody doing anything but that if you were in stand-up comedy that's all you cared about i know i know it's different and i don't put it down i'm just saying that's the way that i approached it so that's all i cared about i didn't get in for the acting i didn't get in it to be uh you know i took acting class because i said you gotta take acting classes because you might get a sitcom offer one day right and you have to do that you like it was like you have to do that i, go, I took it but i never liked acting. i never was good acting i never you know 
I never could get in the moment the way I got in stand-up comedy. On stand-up comedy, I'd be on stage. I had no past, no future. I had that moment. And I, there was no drug like that in the world for me. Yeah. But acting, I'd be like, I'd be like standing there listening to the other person do their lines going, when's my line? When's my line? Here comes my line. Here, why is my hand moving? There goes my hand. Where's it going? What's, what's going on? Right. I, I couldn't get it. Right. So, so in the early 80s, you're, you're, doing, you're, you're on the road. You're, you're headlining on the road. When, when, when is your first uh, television break or, uh, or, or important break, would you say, for your career uh, nationally? In, in, yeah, in 81, uh, they had this show they were taping called Evening at the Improv. Cable TV was just starting to move a little bit in the Evening at the Improv. Yeah. So I wasn't there. I was on the road when Bud Freeman came and, and, and uh, auditioned a bunch of New York comics. So he picked like 12 comics. But his wife said, if you don't take this Rich Scheidner guy, you're crazy. So he booked me sight unseen. And then I end up doing about, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them for the, the run of that show. It ran really? 81 to 94, or 92, whatever it ran from. I did a ton of them. And um, uh, they, that was a great first first thing. Me, I mean, people, it, you, you just got to understand these clubs were open and that was a big credit. He's from Evening Improv and people, there were no other shows where you could see stand-up comedy like this. Like it was like a real comedy club. So right. you go to these new nightclubs, these new comedy clubs, and people would be like, I saw you on that show. And it's like, you, you couldn't believe it because you go, well, I just did this one thing. And but, um, so what and was you, it? Did you see, do you see an increase in your bookings and the money? And the, the bookings were really, it's, it's hard for young, young comics I'm talking to right now. It's hard to understand that they, all you, that what was important was to be able to hold the crowd. You were a headliner if you could do that time and hold them. They, they, they were packed. The rooms were packed. We got paid obscene amounts. If I told you what the, what the openers got, what the middles got, you'd flip out. It was, it was crazy. They were like throwing money at us because they were making so much money. Right. And the clubs were new and the audiences were lined up around the block to see us and they didn't know who we were. They just went, they put an eight by 10 on the door, said, here's this week's monkey. Come see this week's monkey. They just, <laughs> right. they, they, they just wanted to see the monkeys. They didn't care which monkey it was. Just come see. It was a new thing to them. They'd never seen stand-ups like this. And so we were little rock stars running around. We didn't have to do it. You know, we, we didn't, you didn't have to like do any publicity work. You didn't do anything but show up hungover or still drunk to a morning radio show. That was it. Right, right. So what happened when, um, when was your first Carson? When was your first Tonight Show? 84. And what, what was that experience like? And, and I tell you what, I, I, here's what I, and again, I got other advice from people like Lano and others. They said, don't, there was, a, everybody knew who the talent booker was. And this is, again, this one, a Tonight Show was everything. There were only three networks. He was the gatekeeper. You knew you wanted to get on a Tonight Show, at least so your parents would get off your back, whatever it was at the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I was told, don't bother him. He'll find you. He'll, he knows you're there. He, the guy named Jim McCulley was the booker for the comics. So I never approached him, never say, hey, come see me. I never talked to him. I never, you know, comics would try to get up in conversations. If somebody who's talking to a comic, they try to get up and be on the, you know, peripheral of the conversation. And he was like, excellent. And like just zeroing into the comics talking, he you, you never, he'd never give you an inch, you know, right? So I never bothered him, never said a thing to him. And uh, I've been in LA since 82 and 84, uh, the Lippies came and my friend Sam Kennison and I said, we got to get out of L.A. because it's going to be a mess here with the Olympics for so the summer. I said, let's go to New York. So we went to New York for the summer. And um, I was on stage at the Improv, and I came off, and Jim McCulley, who came, he left L.A. too. He said that everybody got sick of L.A. and the Olympics, the traffic and all. And he walked up to me at the Improv in New York and said, you're ready to do the Tonight Show. You want to do it in two weeks? And I didn't. I was like, yeah. It was like August of 84. I said, yeah. And in two weeks, I did the Tonight Show. And so wow. that's that was, you know. And, and, there's an old, there's a saying, there was a comic named Uncle Dirty out of New York. And he used to hang around with Carlin and Pryor. And he was, a, and he was older than us, but he hung with us, right? He was a real wild guy. And he had these great sayings. And he says, uh, he says, don't worry. When they can make money off you, they'll find you. Don't worry about <laughs> bugging people. You just go on stage. All you got to do is go on stage. And when they can make money off you, they'll find you. And that's what happened. Right. So when you when you did your Carson set, when he sees you, right, uh, is it one of these things where they say, all right, you're going to do six minutes, not 530, yeah. not 620, six minutes. So were you showcasing material that he could say, oh, this guy has got a tight five, a tight six? Because I, I, I'm interested also in how thrown into this in the early 80s, how 
uh, you're a pioneer in doing an hour of material of stand up material. Uh, how are you putting that together? How are you deciding what's funny? Excuse me for this. How are you deciding what's what works? What does it? Uh, I was just doing. I was just doing a doing. So once he said you're going to do Tonight Show, then you go over to your set. Then you go, and I met with him at a bar in New York, like a night later. Yeah. Over drinks, you know, just drinking, and uh, and he goes, "Not about this joke. How about that joke?" And I presented with all these jokes. We just you call very unnatural. That's why the segues are always laughable on the Tonight Show. You'd be doing some joke, you know, about water skin, and you go, "You know what? I got water skin. I did my hair wet." And you know, I got to get a haircut. You did like these weird transitions to get from one bit to another that, that wouldn't really flow in your normal set right, in a right. club, right? Because you, you, right? So you cobble this super set together. And here's another thing that Seinfeld told me. You know, he he didn't want to do his first Tonight Show until he had four in a the bank. There was there were comics who 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 fizzled because they go, you come right back, and if you couldn't back it up. Like there were comics who, who faded out after three sets because they didn't have the material. So when Macaulay asked me, I had in my mind, in my mind, I had five clean, you know, client, there were clean shots. You had to do clean shots, right? I had like five of them. Of course, I had a million dick jokes and I had a million club jokes about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. That, that was worth night clubs, but stuff that I could do on a tonight show. In my mind, I had five clean ones, right? And so and I did one, then I come back and do it, but I I there's a long story, but I messed up my second one, but I came, but not anyway, but I, I, I had the material to do lots. Of, and so it served me when I started doing Letterman and Carson at the same time, when I was doing two, you know, I was doing like five, six sets shots a year on the, on the late night shows, then it, it paid off being ahead. And, and when, once you, once you had been on the late night shows, did, did your career, did what happened to your career? I mean, what was it? You get, you get you got noticed. You got noticed. I get invited to to just la just for laughs festival in in Montreal, mm. and then then up there that was a real that was a real feverish place for deals. And I got my first holding deal for a sitcom. I got five or six years in a row of holding deals. But all all leads from those back then that exposure on a Tonight Show was important. And then you you know the clubs would start paying you to mention them on a Tonight Show. So. I go in the club, you do the night show, you get like worth six, seven hundred bucks, but you go, and I'm going to be it. And then you name three clubs because you're going to get a grand from each one of them for naming them, right? It was, it was like a payola for clubs. Yeah, it was a payola. It was a, it was a coked up club owner going, I want to hear my club's name on a tonight show. <laughs> so they tell your agent, you know, and the agents will call him up, go, he's going to be on a tonight show in two weeks, and he'd call up every place, place you were going to be for the next six months. You know, he's, going, he's going to be him. And, and you get, you know, two or three bites and you fuck. I money. never, I never heard about that. It's a real income stream. I never heard about in comedy. It, it was, it was, you know, there were all sorts of things going on like that. You know, where, yeah. where the uh, uh, people were trying to figure out ways to make extra money. Nobody was selling merch. There were two guys, Jackie Martling out of New York, yeah. and 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 James Gregory in the South. They were the only guys selling merch because you didn't need to because you're making so much money. I mean, it's obscene. You know, within two, three years, the amount of money I was making. And, I, you know, when I first started, my rent in New York was 115 a month. I lived in the, in the village, in the East Village, right? Oh boy. So I make 150. So if I did a $55 gig in Jersey, which is that's what all there really was, two or three of those a month, my rent's made, you know? <laughs> it's hard to fathom. So, it's so hard to fathom. Start offering you, when they start paying you two, three, four grand a week in the clubs, you think you're rich, you know? You're like, I'm, 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 you know, this, this explosion. Sure. For, was un unreal and comics don't today you know i know they make there's more comics doing more theaters today the comedy seems better than ever there's more comics doing more theaters there there weren't comics doing theaters like this than ever before and mm. and more comics doing specials than ever before but for this particular time that i i had i mean i, I you know i was lucky that's all right, right. so you're acting you, i know you, you're you're modest but I, I, you are an actor you have you you have I would say you, you know, you have Ain't a, no false modesty, brother. You're, you're a good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm a good five line and under five. Well, lines, the wheels come. The wheels. Well, you make it. A, you make an impression. You have to say you make an impression. I mean, I was immediately uh, one of the first things that comes to mind personally is the uh, the Roxanne scene yeah. from that film. Even though you're only in it for a minute or two, it, it's, a, yeah. it's a it's a critical to the plot and. Uh, I think it's you and Kevin Nealon, right? Or in that. Right. 
You know, and, that's, and there were there were I think there were five or six stand-ups in that movie, and none of us auditioned. It was like Steve Martin told the directors, "I want, I want um, a lot of the stand-ups." We were just the flavor. And by the late '80s, we were the flavor. Really? And I got a lot of shows, just like yeah, I got on all sorts of shows, just acting shows, uh, uh, little movie roles, lots of because they go, "I want to put a stand-up comic in, in on," you know, "I want a stand-up comic in here." And and there was a there was a lot. I got my role on Married with Children. I beat out these other guys who were veteran Broadway actors because the the Fox Network, which was a new network, went. We want that funny guy. He's a stand-up. We saw him on the Letterman show. He's funny. So I have really? him put him in there. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we were we were we were the flavor. We were the flavor. And and with that thing we did with with uh, in in Roxanne was one of the most fun times I ever had. I mean, it was it was. I got the chance. You know that scene he did in a bar where he, um, uh, this guy heckles him and then he does like 20 lines on his big nose. Mm-hmm. And they're really just 20 thick jokes. They're big, they're big nose jokes. A lot of them illusions, you know? <laughs> so the night before he, we do that scene, he, he shoot a scene, I'm like a, a, a reaction shot in a scene. He calls you up, Steve Martin says, why don't you come over and help me rewrite these jokes? Now you gotta understand, this is 1987, right? 10 years before that, I saw him in concert. I'm standing there, one of like 13,000 people at the Capitol Center in Maryland, watching him. I'm just just, just a, one of the people in the crowd laughing and watching people chant out his lines. And then 10 years later, I go to his hotel room and I help him write jokes. Hmm. You don't think that flipped me out? I could believe it. Now, uh, you're, uh, let's talk a little bit about your writing career or, or your writing for comedy and stand-up. Uh, the Foxworthy stuff intrigues me. How did you get involved working with him? Well, I was right doing the Roseanne show and he was on a parking lot. He, he was doing a sitcom and he, and he saw me walking on the parking lot at, at, at his Radford CBS studios over in studio city. And he says, Hey man, how you doing over at Roseanne? I said, well, it looks like we'll be wrapping it up this year and next. He says, well, come right on my show. Now his show didn't last long, but, but we, we formed a friendship. And we, and we knew each other from the clubs back in the day. That's how I got the Roseanne show really, you know, from the clubs. Hey, who did you, you get, who did, by the way, any you young comics, you get your jobs mostly from the people you're friends with in comedy. That's where you get most of your jobs, man. It's it's the ages are great and all, but most of the jobs I got and the people I know were like, you know, no, I want my buddy on this show. He gives them the job writing. You know, I got jobs writing on so many shows because my buddies were the star of the show or were executive producer on the show or whatever. People I met doing stand up comedy coming up. And so this was one of his deals. And then he did um, uh, an HBO, he was doing an HBO special. He asked me to write that with him. And, uh, and then other guys asked me to write from that. You know, I wrote from other, other comics, Ron White and a bunch of other different, Leno, and, mm-hmm. and, and I wrote jokes for Mar. I wrote jokes for people uh, because I got a reputation that I could write jokes that, you know, for comics to, to and, and, and in a range, you know, look, I'm not saying, oh, I'll go write for, you know, Ellen DeGeneres, I don't have a range, but if it's a guy, I'm, I'm pretty good. I've written a couple jokes. I wrote jokes for Roseanne for a special. So, you, you know, I, I, I like writing. I like seeing people get laughs with the jokes. Not as much fun as when you're getting them, but the paychecks are good. And I had a couple of kids at that time, so that was good. So did you work as a staff writer on Roseanne, or was it? Yeah. A, yeah. yeah. And, and who did you know on Roseanne that got you in that? Roseanne. <laughs> <laughs> I got heck. This is a long story, but the short of it was, I got heckled by, I, 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 my last pilot fizzled. I did five pilots, didn't get turned into series. Mm-hmm. Guy named Rick Dukeman and I did a pilot together. Didn't get picked up. I go on the road. Uh, I go to South Carolina. I get heckled by this guy. He was a great heckler, and everybody in here knows I'm talking about the hecklers that make your show better. He was fantastic. And at the end of it, uh, I find out the guy is Sean Penn. Sean Penn is down there to do Dead Man Walking movie and he's hanging out and he's partying like crazy and he wants to hang out and we hang out all night long. I don't drink and do drugs then. I hang out till six in the morning. Like I can't hang out anymore. Like, the Diet Coke ain't keeping me up like what you got. <laughs> and so finally I said, I'm done, Sean. I got to go. He said, wait, wait, before you go, I want to say something. And I thought he was going to say, we got to do a movie together or, you know, you got to write a movie for me. He says, you got to move to L.A. I lived in LA for 10 years. I thought he knew who I was. He thought I was just a wow. funny guy. So in South Carolina, I said, I'm not getting anywhere. I stopped fooling myself. I went home. A friend of mine said, I said, I got two girls. 
I got two little girls and, and I, I can't be on the road all the time. I'm just going to be coming home to see what they've done. I'm going to miss their lives. So a friend of mine, he goes, look, everybody likes your writing. Go write for sitcom. And so um, everybody, I called everybody I knew. It was right during the middle of the season. So there were, I didn't think there were any jobs available, but I was advised by my friend. said, look, call now and set up the, so that you can submit a script for them for the next season. So I called up Seinfeld, I called up Tim Allen, I called up Roseanne. Those are the three people that had sitcoms that I knew. And I was just saying to them, you know, I left messages for each one of them, right? And I said, you know, this, you know, do you get something next year I'd like to, to submit for your staff, you know? I get a call that night from Roseanne. I got lucky. She just fired the whole staff. <laughs> she goes, I love you. Show up tomorrow morning. You got a spot. Wow. I pulled, I haven't even written a spec script. Everybody has to write a spec script. I haven't written a spec script. I drive on the lot. I got my name on a lot, you know, the spot. And I'm a writer now. And that was it. So the, so, so, was a ma- uh, so up until that point, had you written any scripts or was it? No. No, I would no. written scripts, but they were, oh. they were like, they were manifestos more. They were like three-day <laughs> hope binges typed out. You couldn't even, you know, it's, it, it was. Like Kerouac, you know, Kerouac here, script. Here's a 300-page script. It was more like you know Nicholson and The Shining. You know? <laughs> but, but you know, I no, I'd not written, I'd not written scripts. No, no. So how did that work? Your your, your second day on the job, you're around. I would imagine you're around people who have written scripts before. Yeah, but I was also around of other former com. There were a lot of former comics writing for. It was a perfect joke joke job you know it's a perfect job right for people who are joke heavy because they throw out so many jokes during a week in rehearsals that they were constantly generating jokes they needed a lot of joke writers so i i was able to to establish myself as that this right. guy you know he will he will generate jokes and he scores he scores a decent percentage that's what you can hope for they go they so and they and so you go off and just punch up scripts and come back and throw your jokes at them and then the, the head writer so and the, that 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 little group would go. That's good. That's not good. That's good. Not good. And you had right. to let go. It meant nothing. You let go. Or is the next joke? It's not like you're. Oh, these are my babies. You know, this, right. this is like just the job. And then um, and then I learned to write scripts for working there. Then I learned how to write a, a show. Right. And you've written for other shows. Um, I'm trying to think. I know that you. Right is minded a married man. Uh, right, Becker, that's the binder uh, show. Right? Yeah, yeah. One thing leads to another, and. Um, and I, I, I got to stay home when my kids were growing up, which is all that mattered. You know, I, I, got, I got out of stand-up for a while, and I got fat and depressed. That's what happened. But right. I, I paid the bills, and, I, and, and, and everybody was okay. That's all. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, you know, you, yeah, now, let me, let me talk to you about that for a minute, because uh, in this documentary that you're a part of, the uh, I Am Comic. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, a very good documentary. I mean, an excellent documentary about stand-up comedy. The most intriguing part about it is, to me, is you going from uh, helping this other guy make a movie about uh, stand-up comedy to watching other comics do stand-up comedy. You're literally off to the side sweating and going, ah, like, I don't know if you were having it up, but you're like, oh, I can't take this. I can't take this. I got to get up there. Yeah. He, I didn't even know he had a camera on me. I swear to God, we were just in there to watch some comics at UCB in LA. It's so Young funny. <laughs> he taught me. I, by that time, I'd, we'd been at the clubs. I had not gone to the clubs for years. I stayed away. I was just writing TV shows. I'd, I'd stop performing. And so it was a whole new generation because I think generation usually in real life generations is like every 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think in comedy, it moves faster. It's like every 10 years, a new generation, Mm -hmm. things just move too fast. Right. And so there were a whole new generation of comics I'm watching. And, and I'm like, I'm, I'm intrigued and I'm jealous that they're getting these laughs and I want to get back to it. I know it was in my soul to get back to it. I know that sounds like, you know, hippie esque or something, but I mean, he, he he and he goes he just goes you want to do it i go no yeah no yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i do i mean i i the, nobody wants to bomb on a comeback nobody wants to to, to go no especially that. i i can't imagine where you were and then in the film the place the first place is a liquid zoo or something that you're at oh, first uh, place you're, look you're at an open mic. You're at an open mic that a lot of us, many of us today, go to all the time. But that's why he's the director. 
he was smart. He knew he didn't have a movie just on these interviews. He needed a story. And I, I, he saw me as the story. So then he taught me like any director, man. He's like, come on, that'll be great. You're doing, you're the guy, you're the guy, you know, remember you, you're the guy, you're the guy, you can be the guy again. Oh yeah. I'll be the guy again. <laughs> I went in there. I failed so badly. And he took me to place. He didn't go, you take me over to where I maybe knew some comics and maybe some comfortable, a nice improv crowd. Right. He took me to places where he knew, man, he knew it was going to be a, butcher it's just gonna be meat on a table and get whacked and and so that was it and that was the story that but it it, it was a great thing for me it, it it gave me enough taste to make me fight to come back right was, George Brady he did a great job in that and and it was like one of the first documentaries about stand-up I think Seinfeld of course did his first yeah, but Seinfeld did his it, but but it was something you know we we had fun doing it I'll tell you let me let me just say for the folks on the call um that is like one of the must-see documentaries as far as stand-up comedy documentaries go. Uh, and, and the most critical piece to me was the it captures what most of us experience with this. We want to be on stage. We want It's like a drug to make people laugh. That, that, and laughter, I, that laughter. There was nothing like it. And I mean, the film really captures that. So after you had that experience... Uh, did you did you continue doing stand up for a while? Are you still doing stand up or it was a, it was a it was a faltering thing. It was like you know I'd try a little bit, try a, you know I was, was I was struggling, but then I I caught it you know and then I went out to um, the first real break coming back was uh, um, booked in a laugh factor in Vegas, which is kind of like I don't know if you guys are familiar with that club. It's like a boot camp. It's like fourteen shows during the week, and and they wouldn't let me go in the middle. You know, it's no, you're a headliner. You're going as a headliner, oh, and so I, so I had to strap it up. But you know, you only do 35 minutes as a headliner there. But um, uh, it was it was like boot camp. You know, it's like I just I had to like strap it up and get it going. And it was a Vegas crowd, and I got my feet back. You know, I started to get back in shape. You know, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, now I I don't want to take too much of your time, but so I want to talk specifically <laughs> about. <laughs> you can tell them in my room. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's yeah, true. I'm a busy man, Rob. I got a lot of things going on. A lot of things. Uh, I, got, well, I got stuff lined up on Netflix for days. I got to get to it. I got a lot of stuff on Netflix. I got to get to it. He's got to get through his queue. He's right, got to go right, watch right, Tiger right, King again. I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, Tiger King. My kids yeah, right. are great this whole time. They might be dead in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Rich, I want to I want to open it up to the to the group yeah, here. But yeah. before I do, I, I want you to talk a little bit about. Um, your uh, the show the uh, the history of, of stand up that you're doing. Tell us about that. Well, I just take it up. I just take it main, mainly as as the title implies. Comics are the most we're the most reflective art form. We're the most real time art form. We reflect what's going on in society. So the jokes, the material that the comedians do, reflect the obsessions, the fears, the zeitgeist of the of the country at any particular time better than any other art form. So that's why comics, uh, you know, get hung about the material, but our material doesn't last like a song does because it's so tied to an air. It's so perfectly tied to an air, the best material. So I just go through each era and talk about the game changers, people who change the art form, what things like technology or laws that change the art form and, and what particular comics said at any particular time about it. So I go through and there's some surprises or people have never comics never uh, comic, even comics haven't heard of. There's some comics I talk about. And then there's stories and jokes. I get to do these jokes by these greats. I, I had to work hard to find jokes that would get laughs today that were like 50 or 80 or 100 years old. Right. So if you put them in, the, I found if I put it in the right context, um, you know, some of these jokes still work, you know. And, and so I go right from Artemis Ward up to, and I stop at Steve Martin because right before he was the last before the comedy boom. So that's the modern era for me. Right. So I don't think people need to be told about that because it's the same thing. I mean, the comics, they still just do the same thing. They reflect. And then I wrap it up and, uh, you know, talk about what I love. The, and I told a, good, a, a nice story at the end, you know, like a, 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 and, and uh, talk about how the art form, art form has changed. I mean, 100 years ago, it was all white men doing stand up. There, there weren't any different voices. Right. And now there's a voice from every demographic you can think of. It's 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 amazing how much the art form has changed that way, just in terms of who gets to speak it. And you and this show you can do it in comedy clubs, theaters. I do it, I've done it anywhere, and, and I've done it in 
in in uh, uh, I've done it in small theaters. I've done, done it in comedy clubs. I've done it in off days and Sundays. Like I'm going to do it again down at the Laughing Stock Comedy Club in Atlanta. I'll do it on a Sunday afternoon. And it's a small room. I don't need you know, a big crowd, but you know they'll pack out 60, 70 people in there. We did it uh, before a couple of months ago, like last fall. No, that, that was, shoot, that was last August. I did it there. Oh, so I'm okay. just building it. I'm just building. All right. Well, well we we we'll, we well, I'm going to do everything I can to get you here out on Long Island. I, I, I mean, love I'm, that. I, I want it. I, believe look, me. I'm not looking to make. Look, I, honestly, Rob, and you can tell the guys, I'm I'm working Dura deals with anybody. I'm not looking to make money. If okay. I can make my expenses, right. I'm happy. Right. Believe, believe me, so believe that. I know enough. I know a lot of producers that are, would love to make money off of you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> They're very good at that. Uh, my last question. You'll bring a little bit more juice out of this old fruit. <laughs> That's dog. right. Yeah. What do we get? So my last question to you, uh, then we'll open it up. Um, given what's going on today, uh, this uh, this pandemic, this COVID, whatever it is, it's just uh, terrible for everybody. Once we come out of this, what do you think the impact is going to be on live stand-up comedy? Have you thought well, about that? Yeah, this is my, again, I, just an opinion, and I've got more opinions than my knowledge or IQ would allow, uh-huh. but I, I give it anyway. The point is, young people got to get out. They got to, you know, when you're young, and I, I can think back, I got two kids, you know, three kids, but two of them are that age that they just got to get out, and they're going to get out. They got to get out and get. So they're, I think, going to get back out into groups, bars, shows, pretty fast. Older people may take more time because of the fear, but I think the younger people are going to get back out to it fast. I don't think it's going to be like I know people are like, oh my god, this could affect live shows forever. You, there's nothing like that. There's not. Look, you go to young, you go to a rock concert when you're young. This is I'm just speaking about me because you want to be around fifteen other people, fifteen thousand other people your age jumping up and down to that song or whatever it is because you want to be around that group you want to be with them it feels good it feels wild mm. and so the live shows i think are going to come back they're going to be fine i think they're going to come back and they're going to come back people are going to be pent up they're going to want to get out and get around that's going to maybe it's going to make sure to be a little tentative at first i think because they want to make sure that you know they don't go out and then two days later there's an outbreak in their neighborhood but Right, right. I think it, I think in in a, in in a relatively short amount of time, people will get back out. They got to get. We, we're a social animal. We you can't laugh like you laugh when you're with five hundred people. You laugh because those other people are laughing. That's why you laugh. You sit home. You don't laugh like a hyena by yourself watching the TV. Anybody? Any other people do that? I don't. I yeah. sit there going mm-hmm. and smile. Said, yeah. All right. Well, well, Rich. I want to before so I get the opportunity here. Uh, it's amazing that you were able to do this for us. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it for us. Um, the po- the folks here, uh, really great bunch of people that are like you in your early career are dedicated to stand up so much so that they're jumping on this stupid call with me. Sure. They, they do well, it every day. Right. Not when you're here, they do it just to come to see me. So I talk that's to right. me. I, I, that's what I responded to you. I, I love that. And I, I have a lot of contacts with people all over. I, I, you know, I help people with the material or, or talk. Well, we, we should talk because I, we're, we're going to talk, Rich. We're going to talk. I love, this. I love this. I love, right. I love it. Uh, all right. So uh, is anybody, I, some of you guys are mute, so you'll have to wave. Uh, does anybody want to have, have a question for Rich? You want to ask him something? Okay. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. Hi, Rich. Um, I have like a couple of jokes right now. One is about, people in Hollywood, another one's about, um, they're all about people being famous. Now, I've been told by comedians to, like, have an opener to explain who you are, and I want to do something about, like, how it angers me how people hero hero worship in this country. Do you think I should do a joke there, or should I try to make that short enough and then get into the jokes? Because the jokes are very different types of punchlines, but they're all about, like, you know, you know, people in Hollywood and Harry and Megan and the angry bagel boss guy and stuff like that. So I, I'm not, so you're, you're putting down the people who are, you're, you're putting down the famous people or you're putting down the people who, who idolize the famous people. Um, uh, that people that idolize the people, like people hero worship other people. in this Right. Country. Right. So what, and your question is whether you should do what? 
I, should I try to do a joke there or should I make that short and sweet so I can get to the jokes? Cause that's kind of like a setup of what I'm trying to get into. I'm trying so, to get So, into. so uh, let me, let me, let me kind of try and interpret. So you, so you, uh, you feel strongly about how uh, people chase after fame or no, I, put, I, put I, people who are famous on pedestals. Is that what you're yeah, I, I mean, famous people on pedestals. There's people in this country that will put, you know, although none of these jokes about politics, about politicians, people in Hollywood, and, and so on and so forth. I'm not angry at the those people. I'm angry at the people that put them up on pedestals. So you want to make the target of the joke the uh, the people that are dumb enough to fall for these so, guys. So you want, you want to know whether you want to do a joke. So you want to do a joke before you get to those jokes. About, yeah, like... So it, 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 this is my, again, only opinions and, and setup. But if you can include yourself with the people in the audience at any time, I think it helps the jokes go better. So if you can go, look, you know, I'm a sucker. Now just this off the top of my head. I'm a sucker for this stuff, man. I don't know why I watch. I'm like, so you're going to be making fun of most of the people in that audience because most people are curious about these people. That's why they keep feeding them to us, right? So – Put yourself in there. Go like I know I'm about ready to do jokes about people idolizing people, but I'm I'm also aware of them, so I must be following them in some way. I mean, there's got to be a way to to to, to say, look, I I, I yeah, you know, I got my own problems with this, right? But yeah. here's what I don't like. So when you you include yourself, you know, it's like not self-deprecating, but you include yourself as as part of the audience. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm a sucker for famous. Basically, saying like I'm a sucker for famous people. Like you guys probably are. So, I mean, not saying in those words, but you know, like, you know, that, you know John John Mellencamp had a line in his songs that I, I'm I, I'm glad to be in a small town, but I'm still hicking up to wonder what's going on in the big town. Yeah. There's always that element of like, yeah, I don't like it. What what they do? I don't I don't want to hear any more about what they do. You know, there's always that element. Yeah. You know? right. So you've got to you've got to acknowledge that that's part of what you're about to do because you're doing that. If you don't have the self awareness of it, you need to look at it. Why? Who, who, what do you talk about there says what you care about? Yeah. Right. right? I feel yeah. like I can just go into my rest of my jokes basically about me and having an affair and being an IT guy. And I think it's a good transition. Okay. I, thank yeah. you. So much. Cool. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Jean Marie. Hi. How are you doing? I think Hi. we have a friend. Do you know Bill Keller? Of course. He lived in my basement for the first uh, 15 years of my life. <laughs> I always say I grew up with a comedian living in my house. <laughs> yeah. That's a joke right there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, when I took the class with, um, oh, God, now, now his name, uh, uh, John Trusen, uh, he asked me how I got into comedy. I was saying, well, I grew up with a comedian in my basement. He goes, who was it? And I, and I told him, Bill Kelly goes, I knew Bill Keller. He's like, I was at your house in your basement. So people, comedians <laughs> were coming in and out of my house and up in diapers. But that's how you caught the disease. Uh, that's yeah, how you caught it. the virus. And my yeah. tried to keep me away from it. And then after my mother died, I said, screw it, I'm getting on stage. And my mother died in July and I started doing comedy in September. So and now I'm addicted. So this is probably why she wanted to keep me away from it. But anyway, um, you know, I have, a, I also, I have a, a disease lupus. And um, so uh. my whole life, I self quarantined for being on medications that lower my immune system because it's yeah. an disease. And I've always worried about hand washing. I've always had my kids, you know, so these current events, my, my question, I guess, is I, I recently, since I've only been in comedy a few months, but before all this happened, like in January and December, I wrote a bunch of jokes about how I'm neurotic about when the kids get home from school, I basically put them in a Purell dipping station and have one of those like CDC, um, what do they call them when they come? A hazmat suit. A hazmat. Has, well, instead of pajama day, there should be a hazmat suit day at school because I'm not going to let my kids go to school in pajamas all day, then put them in their bed with those pajamas. So I have a lot of jokes about how employees wear the gloves and then they touch your bag so, touch your money and then they make your food and the same. Yeah. But do I, now the question is, am I going to have to change some of that now that this has become such an issue in society? No, 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 early. no it's up it, just up it, just up it. Now that was before this ever happened. Now 
You don't even know where your kids are. You haven't let them in the house for three weeks. But they're toughening <laughs> up out there. You know they're getting tough. You okay. hear them moving around outside in the woods near your house once in a while. So you know they're doing okay. You know, you just up it. Just up it. Just do the okay. same stuff. This is, this is what you did before the pandemic. And now, then you just up it. Just to elevate just start it. out with, before all this craziness happened, I used to do this, this, right. and this. Right. I, I, I was obsessed because I have lupus. People understand it. They go, look, I, I, had, I was obsessed with it because I had lupus. This is what I did before the virus arrived. And now, since the pandemic, my kids, I don't even know where they are. I put, I don't let them in the house for three weeks. I hear them on the roof once in a while. They try to get in, you know, if I got things pretty locked down. But they're okay. toughening up out there. I know it. They're toughening up. I love it. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. You throw out food every couple of days. You throw out a bag of food. You know, whatever. Like <laughs> pancakes under the door. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just up it. Just up it. All right. Oh. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Who, who, Hi, Rich. Richie, I remember you from the improv. I think I was there that night that Jim McCauley saw you. I, and you were ex so exciting. And you did this joke. Whoa, who is this? Where am I? Where are you? My money is Ellen. Ellen Orchid. Oh, he's... Uh, he, left. he was probably trying to slide it because it's two pages. You have to slide oh, it. Oh, he has to slide it. I think, he's, I think he, he dropped off. Let's give him a minute. How exciting is this, huh? Isn't that <laughs> great? He's great. What a great speaker. He's a great speaker. He got some very interesting information. I didn't expect him to laugh so hard about Bill Kelly, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny, though. Come back, Rich. <laughs> He'll come back. I was trying to get on with you. Did yeah. You I guess yeah, well, well every, everyone will get a chance to talk to him. if he, He's sitting in his bathrobe, like he said. What else is he doing? I know. That was doing? hysterical. <laughs> does he have, excuse me. Does he have a time limit? Uh, no, we, we didn't really talk about it. I'm sorry, Kevin. All, All right, right, Kevin. Thanks for coming in, buddy. Thank you. All Appreciate right. We'll see, we'll see you next week. Bye, Kevin. All yeah, right. Bye. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I was an old man there for a second. Oh, Paul came in and I hit the wrong button. That's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Alan, you, you had a question for, uh, for Rich? Well, I've been a fan of yours since I saw you at the improv. I think I was, I believe I was there that night when you, uh, did a set for Jim McCauley, and you did a joke about, I remember a joke you did, you said, you accept the fact of death, but you don't want to have a stupid death. Like yeah. Like yeah. on a rake. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Wow. I can't believe you remember that. I yeah. What you doing. Just fine. Just fine. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's good to see you. Yeah, I can't wait to see your show, too. Cool, cool. Yeah. Cool. cool. Yeah, that's, I did a whole series of jokes about how to die, how I want to die, don't want to die. You know, a whole bunch of stuff. I, I was very obsessed with death at, at 30. <laughs> More so than I want him now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great stuff. Uh, all right. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, but Debbie, did you want to ask Rich? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, Rich, first of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us and, and give me hope, you know, because... A lot of comics are saying they're concerned that the comedy is, is a way, it's, that's the way it was, it's not going to come back. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you gave me the hope. One of the questions that I have, um, my daughter's doing comedy, she's doing pretty well, and sometimes people say I should talk more about her. I know she talks about me, she does mom bashing, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one. Well, that's comedy one hundred and one. That's well, right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, hey, Debbie, Debbie, maybe you should in inform Rich that your your daughter is actually a, a very hot comedian in New York City. He might not know her. Not he might not know her, but she's like she's pretty hot. She's playing the cellar. She's been on Letterman. Oh, she's good. done. She's done real stuff. So. Just wanted to point that out. What, so. What's her name? What's her name? Adrian Appalucci. Uh, I look for her. I've heard of her. It's I A P A. <laughs> Appalucci. Yeah. Well, look, it's all fair game. My daughter's, my oldest daughter is a musician. She has a band, but she also does stand up comedy, right? And the gig economy, she got, you know, but she does jokes about me. I don't do jokes about her. Never did jokes about my kid kids that you know when I, uh, especially when they're old enough to talk and <laughs> hear it, right so but but she does jokes about me and it's all fair games and i've done jokes about her doing stand-up and and um 
it's 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 all fair game. Have fun with her. You know, she's doing it. You know, you could do jokes about her. Oh, yeah, she was funny then, but not you know, not so funny when she did this, right, or whatever. Um, and then she'll, she'll it'll be more fuel for her. She'll be like, now my mom is doing stand up. Like 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 the enough nightmares I have. Well, I actually mother now I have a mother doing stand up. Right. Well, I started first, but I never stayed with it long enough. So I'm actually doing it a few years. And I was stuck on a joke where I'm uh, talking about her biological father, I've been married three times, was a heroin addict. And how he, you know, how I, he was the love of my life and how cute he looked nodding out. And I'm nodding. I'm making it short, of course. And she puts on Facebook. Now, she, she actually, she defriended me on Facebook. But my daughter told me that she was very upset. She said, you see? You see what Adrian put on you? She's making a fool of you. And, and she put down my little clip. She cut it. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm, I was so happy that she was acknowledging that I was a comic. <laughs> you know, so. There's a reality show here. I'm telling you. <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears, Rich. <laughs> oh, man. That, uh, that, is, that is good crazy. I like crazy. That's good crazy. I like good family dramas. Yeah. That's good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks, Debbie. Keep thanks. going, Ma. Keep going. It looks like you're rattling her cage. I'd keep going if I were you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Who's next? Who's next? Who wants to say so? Donna. Donna. Yeah, just yeah. a quick question. Did you know Jennifer Miller from the Roseanne show? The I do not remember her. No, I don't remember her. Oh, okay. She was the writer on the show. Maybe not at the same time. Jennifer Miller. I just. No, she's she's probably one of the ones that Roseanne fired the day before she hired you. You know, when, when they when they brought the show back, somebody said, you know, uh, what, what writer is going to bring back? And 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 somebody else cracked. They said, what what, what one of the fifteen hundred writers they were going to bring six back out of like there were like how many hundreds of writers went through there? So I don't know. You know, Did you, were you writing on there when Norm was writing on there? <laughs> yeah, I just Norm? missed Norm's exit. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. Did you ever hear, did you ever tell that story? You ever hear that story? No, what's the story? So Norm, like, you know, they, they'd be in meetings, you know, and it, it's hard, you know, there's 20 people sitting around the comics. We're used to like just doing what we want to do and we want to do it. So Norm gets like, you know, um, they're there, they're there um, having a meeting. They're all in the room trying to bang this thing out. And Norm says, I'm going to take a smoke break. He walks out. This is like first thing in the morning. He does not come back. He's not come back, man. <laughs> somebody goes, somebody finally knows, hey, where's Norm? I haven't seen him in a couple hours. They're still in this room all together. You know, it's a real uh, pressure cooker, you know. And so they finally, they, every day they would take a walk. The whole writing staff would take a walk, walk around the lot. You know, like, you know, about a half mile walk, just as a break thing. So it's the afternoon. They haven't seen Norm all day. And they take a walk. Now, they, they see Norm. He's smoking a cigarette down by the river. <laughs> and, he's, and he's got a drink of some sort. <laughs> and he, and it's, like, it's like a homeless guy by the river. You know, they, they, they're coming around the corner. They see Norm. He spots them. He just gets up and runs off the lot. Just runs. <laughs> just runs away from them. He was done. He was, I'm done. I can't be around you people anymore. <laughs> he is one of the funniest guys. He is naturally one of the funniest guys ever. I, I think most of us would agree. He's He certainly uh, yeah. is. He's best storyteller. Best storyteller. Uh, so, Richard, you got you, you have something you want to ask, Rich? Yes. Hi, my name is Rich. Nice name, Rich. <laughs> nice meeting you. <laughs> what is your opinion? Like, in one of my part of my routine, I make fun of like Rosie O'Donnell in one of my bits. What's your opinion of actually making fun of actual celebrities? Here, here is my thing about it. I was never comfortable, and again, this is obviously Joan Rivers really started the celebrity bashing thing, and there's many, many other people have picked it up, and it's, it's. I, I can. I was always uncomfortable making fun of somebody not to their face. So if I was going to do a thing about somebody. I'd like them to be there to see. You know I mean? I, I, so I had a joke early in my career. I talked about this in my book, Kicking Through the Ashes. Ringo Starr, one of the Beatles, uh, back in the 80s, he did like a wine cooler commercial. This is, you know, a wine cooler commercial. He was one of the Beatles. He did a wine cooler commercial with a, with a polar. He written this wine. So I, my joke was, you see that ring wine cooler commercial with Ringo Starr? I mean, Ringo, have you spent all the Beatle money, right? Okay. And it was a big laugh back then. And then one night I come off stage and one of the other comics comes and says, Ringo was in the room when you did that joke. And I felt weird. 
I felt weird for a moment. And then I go, I go, then I go, did he laugh? I want to know if he laughed, right? And the guy goes, I don't know. I go, what do you mean? How could you tell me that not know whether he laughed? <laughs> You're a comic. You weren't watching to see if he was laughing at that joke, you know? <laughs> so, so, um, I, I never, I never was comfortable doing those kind of jokes, you know? So that's, that's just me, but, but it's up to you. If you want to take that tack, take it. You, you know, could it backfire later in a career if there's a career happening? I don't know. I never, if you don't, don't ever judge, don't ever judge your career. Don't, I, I think there's a mistake. And I, this is in my opinion, again, to, to think, to worry about your career, about what you do on stage. You're up there to be funny. That's the only mm -hmm. license you got to be up there is to be funny. That's the only, that's your only qualification to be up there is to be funny. So if you're up there thinking about career moves while you're trying to be funny, I think you're at, I think you're at cross purposes. Nothing, okay, nothing thank you. anything get in the way of being funny in that moment. So if it's funny, do it. You know, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't do it. But don't think about it as a career move. Oh my God, Rosie O'Donnell might not hire me one day. Shoot, there have been people, <laughs> I've done jokes about lots of people, and they've hired them just because they were good jokes about them. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent point. Who's next? Raise your hand. Do something. Big, oh, all right, Mike. Okay, hang on, hang on, Mike. Let's see. I, I muted you, Mike, because there's some noise in the back. I'm sorry. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, I uh, I want to thank you first for doing this, for This is uh, pretty amazing, I think. Um, I started comedy 20 years this month, and I remember reading about you back then. That's just uh, as a compliment. To start Thank off with, you. I have a friend of mine uh, living down there in North Carolina with you, Jeff Martyr. Yeah, Jeff's down in South Carolina. I got to see him when this South is over. South Carolina, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to do this history show over in Charlotte. Hopefully, if we're still doing this, I'm supposed to do it there on May 7th or 8th or something like that. And Jeff will come up and, and hopefully we'll have a meal together. I've known Jeff since he first started and his mom and opened up this comedy club in Baltimore. I've known Jeff that right. long. Right, Jeff's a great, a good friend of mine. A uh, quick story about Jeff, and then I'll get to my question. Um, he hadn't, he still does not perform, of course, uh, mostly because of his mother. Um, I, I was, he hadn't performed about fifteen years, and I was running shows and still am up on Long Island. And I talked him into going after fifteen years and doing a set at my room. And I just sat there mesmerized at his talent and his ability. Uh, he said he'd do five minutes. He did 12. He couldn't get off the stage. <laughs> he couldn't get off the stage. Of course he wouldn't get off, right? I mean, I never got him back on again. So I, I felt that was me. That's a big thing, doing that for him. I love that you're laughing. I think what? that's great, especially... In the business so long, man, you're laughing. And guess what? Everybody in this group tonight, I'm sure um, they needed a laugh. And and boy, you sure did bring it tonight. Uh, my question is this: How do I access? Uh, oh man, your, how do I access your doc? Uh, I I think I am comic might be on YouTube. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I I know that um. um Get my contact information from Rob. I'll find out if, if there's a if there's a code you need for YouTube. I'll find out from Jordan Brady, the director. Anybody wants to see it, I'll get the code. If there's, that, if there's I don't I, I I have copies here at the house. I've been watching a long time, but um, that that would be I, I awesome. Yeah, I think I think if you look around on YouTube, you can see parts of it or most the of thing, it. The whole thing. The whole thing's not on YouTube. I'll ask Jordan. Yeah, you you can see the it. you can see the whole thing on YouTube and not pay a penny. But I'd like you to get a penny. <laughs> no, How can we, we, sure? we lost money. We lost money. Of that course. We all lost but money. What is nobody, about? nobody ever makes any money off documentaries except for three people. And we weren't one of them. Oh, uh, that's terrible. We got to tell you. All right. So, all right. So now the cat's out of the bag. Yes, you can see it on YouTube. Put in I am comic on YouTube. It's the yeah. first thing that comes up. Don't worry. And Rich, yeah. well, Rich will figure out. We're going to have Rich no, come no, up here in person. It, it, don't worry about real money. Money. All right. <laughs> it is one of the best documentaries you'll ever see. I'm, I'm not kidding about stand-up comedy. And I love that Seinfeld one. I push that on everybody. I push that on everybody because of the work, the work ethic. But the reality is your documentary is what it's all about. That's what drives us. We're all driven by that desire to get up on stage. 
I, 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 I'll tell you this is, uh, I, I interviewed um, a bunch of people. Greg Giraldo was one of them. He's in that documentary. He talks about the physical feeling of the laughter on your body. Mm. Is, is, a, is if you're, if you're a real comic, it's a, it's a physical feeling. I mean, it calms me in a way. Nothing has ever calmed me. It's my music. I can hear things, you know, I, I, I remember watching a friend of mine who's a musical director and the, the band is playing, this whole big high school band is playing. And he goes, hey, wait a minute, wait, that third trumpet, you're off a little bit. I go, how did you hear that? I, I don't hear anything wrong at all. Do you know what I mean? They hear that kind of thing in the music. I hear that in the laughter. I go, wait a minute, man, I'm getting a little too bass in this. I'm losing the women. I'm only getting the men laughing. You know, I can hear that laughter and calibrate it. And, and I can hear when somebody's laughing uniquely. I can hear that special little laugh in there. Mm. It, it's... It's something else that I, that I, that I, I can't live without it. Right. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, anybody else have anything that they want to ask Rich? He's very approachable for a big celebrity, so you well, can you guys, ask. You guys, you guys can contact. Hey, you guys can. Oh, go ahead. There's another question, Donna. I just wanted to. Uh, I'm Karen. Hi, I just Karen. wanted to thank you for coming on and spending time with us. That was great. My, my pleasure, Ken. Listen, I, I'm, I'm very accessible. I don't have anything to do. I'm not kidding you. And uh, uh, so, you know, Rob has my contact information. You can contact me on Facebook. And if you want to talk about your stuff or whatever, and I, you know, I'm, I'm for light advice. And I, you know, so I'm not trying to push anything. But uh, right now, I'm going to go finish. My, I'm going to go eat. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. All right. All right. Oh, cool. I, I want to thank. Let's let's thank all. Uh, let's give him a big hand, Rich. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Live. Right. And Rich, I'll I'll be in touch. I want to. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, just let them know. Let any of your your people know. They, you got my contact info. You can give it. To yes. Them. It doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, and we're gonna definitely get you up here to do this. We want you to do the thank show. You. Thank you. Man. All right. All right. Thanks, Rich. All right, everybody. We'll see everybody next week. Have a good weekend.